Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul and after our breakdown of Terminator 2, I promised I'd be back with another big Arnie movie. This week I've decided to tackle the sci-fi action film Predator which is easily one of the best movies from the 80s. Like a lot of Arnie's early action films, the movies are classic and in this video we're going to be breaking it all down. This includes easter eggs, hidden details and also the making of trivia that shows how good this movie really is. Cause some damn fool accused you of being the best. Now weirdly, the idea for Predator was actually inspired by Rocky and a joke that one of the writers overheard. The punchline was that after Rocky 4, Balboa had beat the Russians and had no one else that he could fight. All that was left was aliens and after a Rocky vs E.T joke, this inspired screenwriter brothers Jim and John Thomas to go make the movie. Now though they didn't necessarily lean into the Rocky thing, they clearly took ideas from Rambo and in my research I actually expected to come across some stuff on Sly Stallone. Him and Arnie had a big rivalry at the time but unfortunately Sly fighting E.T is something we're just gonna have to imagine. Now there's also some urban myths centred around aliens that do somewhat have their roots in reality. It has been rumoured this film only got put into production because James Cameron's classic had been so well received. It would be years before Alien 3 got put into production and thus 20th Century Fox wanted to get something out in the downtime. According to the rumours, this is why Predator got greenlit but it was actually in production during 1985. This was a whole year before Alien's release but it has to be said that the success of it pushed the film further along. Originally titled Hunter, the first draft centred around a group of alien hunters made up of various species that all had various goals. It was basically a safari trip to Earth with the focus on the creatures before things were reworked to centre on a soul hunter. This would be tackling the most dangerous game in the universe which was going to be shown to be man. That's right yeah, most dangerous game in the universe, I'll spoil Avengers Endgame two days before it releases, don't you worry about it. Now originally there was only going to be one target and this would be a Native American character which is kind of poignant looking back. As we know the lead would be reworked into Arnie and the Native American character would then morph into Billy. However why I'm saying it's poignant is because decades later we get the Prey prequel which would of course centre around a Native American character battling the beast. Now when Arnie came in he suggested that they centre it around a team of crack commandos because he wanted to make a film like The Magnificent Seven. Over time the script was reworked several times with them eventually ending up with what we got in the end. This would culminate with the elements of the modern world being stripped away so that all that was left were primitive weapons. Come the end of the film the hunter becomes the hunted and I've always loved how the dynamics of this movie flip for the end. Now the Predator is of course one of the most iconic creatures of all time and it stands out for a number of reasons. Designed by Stan Winston its mouth was meant to resemble a tarantula and its skin also shares similar properties to Locust. However it wasn't always this way and had they stuck with the original design then the iconic creature would have looked totally different. The first design was far more insect like in its appearance with Arnie describing it as a bug with a duck's head. Now Jean-Claude Van Damme was actually brought in to play the role and this is because he was seen as someone who could bring agility to the performance. If you've ever watched the behind the scenes stuff then you've probably seen some of the footage with him and the actor actually shot several key scenes. This included the moment in which he killed Dylan and Van Damme's been pictured alongside Cole Weathers several times on set. There's also a shot where a bright red version of it races through the jungle and this was a technique that they used to create the cloak. The bright red was used because it was the exact opposite to the green of the jungle and the blue that you got in the clear skies. The creative team would come in and film two takes with the suit running through one whilst it was absent in the other. The one with it missing would be filmed with a wider lens and thus a vague outline of the alien could be seen with the footage bending around it. Using chroma key techniques they then dropped the red suit out and what we got in the end was the brilliant cloak effect. Now that of course made it to the film but what didn't was Jean-Claude Van Damme. Complaining that the suit was too difficult to move around in, they then brought in Stan Winston to redesign the character. This new version was 8.5 feet tall with Kevin Peter Hall now in the role. It was extremely difficult to move around in still and they often had to use a bungee rig and other tricks to keep it in place. The suit was so heavy that the tree at the end is actually made out of concrete and this is because a real one wouldn't support the weight. Paul had a nightmare on set, the guy was constantly worn out but as a thank you director John Tierman ended up including him in the movie. At the end Dutch is picked up by a chopper and the pilot of this is none other than the actor. 
Now, sadly, he passed away in 1991, and this was after he contracted HIV from a blood transfusion. Paul died a month short of his 36th birthday, but his performance will live on forever in this and Harry and the Hendersons. Now, for iconic as The Predator is, I don't think the movie would have been as big of a success without its core cast. If you've been following our Alien Threat Respective, then you'll know how much we talk about how important the side characters are. In a film like Alien 3, when almost all the characters look and act the same, it's difficult as an audience to get attached to them. However, films like Alien and Aliens have several memorable cast members, so when you're watching them get taken out, you actually feel something. That's what I feel like the case is with Predator, and all these characters definitely stand out. McTeenan really wanted them to build up some camaraderie, and he actually had the cast training together for weeks before they started shooting. Beginning at 6am, they'd run through fitness and firing regimes that made them all come together as one cohesive unit. However, as I'm sure you can guess, th these guys had, le let's say, some friendly competition that led to some hilarious stuff happening on set. When you've got a guy who's won Mr. Universe several times, people are, are obviously going to want to try and outdo him on screen and look the most macho in this movie of macho men. Everyone was getting up early to work out before going to set and Cole Weathers is talking about some of the stuff they got up to. He said that Jesse Ventura would arrive 15 minutes before Arnie and he'd pour a bottle of water over himself as he was coming in. This made Arnie think that he'd been sweating due to working out for hours and thus Arnie started arriving earlier in order to try and beat him. Weathers got in on this too and he said that it got to a point where they were working out at 3am. However, Weathers said that he'd act like his physique was given to him naturally and he'd work out away from all the actors so they couldn't see. Now Ventura, yeah, he was over the moon after learning from the wardrobe department that his arms were bigger than Arnie's. Delighted, he suggested to the actor that they have an arm measuring contest and the winner of this would get a bottle of champagne and of course the loser would be embarrassed. However, Ventura lost because it turned out that Arnie had told the wardrobe department to tell him that his arms were bigger. I think when you see the characters, you can kind of feel this camaraderie leaping off the screen and it helps to make the characters so memorable. Now one thing I actually forgot until doing this breakdown was that the movie begins with a shot of the ship coming into Earth. Akin to the opening of the thing, this teases what's to come and it instantly lets us know that the movie's about an alien. Now when talking about this movie, a lot of those I spoke to completely forgot this is how it opens up and we question whether it kind of spoiled the mystery that this movie centers around. This is something the creative team apparently wrestled over too but ultimately in the end they settled on keeping it. I think without it, you just have no idea of what the Predator is when the movie finished, so this at least gives you an idea of what's going on. Anyway, from here we go to the crew coming in and watch them getting off the chopper. Everyone's got their own luck, but Arnie's easily given the best intro of them all. Sitting in the seat, we watch him sparking up a cigar, and this is something the actors smoke throughout his entire life. Carl Weathers actually blames Arnie for getting him hooked on them as he gifted him a box on set and never looked back. Either way, he's the portrait of masculinity and it cements a tone that they're going to be going for. However, because of health and safety, Arnie wasn't just allowed to spark one up inside a helicopter, so the flames we see were actually added in post-production. Now Arnie was obviously coming off the back of Commando and the similarities actually go just beyond the tone. That movie has the fictional South American country in a called Valverde, which is also something that pops up in this film. McTiernan would also go on to direct several films in the Die Hard franchise too, and those films contain a mention of it as well. So technically, yeah, they're all in the same universe, and McTiernan tends to do little things that connect all his movies. A bit off track, yeah, yeah, but Die Hard is John McClane coming off a plane, bringing his wife a giant teddy bear, and wrapped around it is a big red bow. In The Hunt for the Red October, we end with Jack Ryan boarding a plane, and he also takes a teddy bear with a red bow around it. We'll save that for our Die Hard breakdown, but we watch as Dutch arrives to learn about the mission. A helicopter carrying a cabinet minister has apparently gone down behind enemy lines, though as we learn, there is more to it. Now interestingly, the person they're trying to find is called Jim Hopper, which is the name of the character David Harbour plays in Stranger Things. Shane Black's character is also called Hawkins, and potentially they use both of these to influence the show. Either way, at this point we're introduced to Dylan, and we get what's one of my most favourite moments in film. You son of a bitch. I love how the handshake sort of changes into an arm wrestle and it shows how competitive that Dutch really is. It also solidifies the idea that he's the best and it makes sense why the Predator views him as an equal. Now the way the mission's pitched is that it's played as a rescue mission which is the only way that they would have got Dutch on board. 
This is actually hinted to us earlier in the scene when Dylan asks why Dutch didn't help out when they were in Libya. Good old days. Yeah, like the good old days. Then how come you passed on Libya, huh? Oh, that wasn't my style. Come on. Why'd you pass? We a rescue team, not assassins. So we get the idea that Marley is upright and that his team also works alone. General, my team always works alone. You know that. They actually gave a little nod to this in the credits and the entire crew's name all appear in one block together. This is because, yeah, they work alone and these credits also contain a detail that ties back to the group. In it we can catch Shane Black reading a copy of Sergeant Rock which was used as the basis to influence the commandos. This was a comic that Arnie was actually planning on adapting and he brought several of them to the set to read during the downtime. As we know, that never got made but at least it's still got a place appearing in this movie. Shane Black was brought in to do rewrites of the dialogue and he'd get his own chance at a Predator film decades later. Shane Black was behind the Predator, but yeah, the less, the less said about that the better. Anyway, we watch as the choppers fly in and hear the song Long Tall Sally by Little Richard. Yeah, this song actually appears later on in the film and Mac sings it at one point. Long Tall Sally, she's Bill Sweet, she got everything and what the John need. I love the red light filter that they have here and it could be used as a way to foreshadow the bloodshed that the crew are about to face. This moment with the helicopters of course mirrors Vietnam and we learn that both Dylan and Dutch were deployed there during 1979. No one respects Dylan though because he's got a desk job and we see how the crew instantly suss him out. Dropping in they scout out the area and eventually come across a collection of skinned corpses. We will have to blur this because of YouTube but if you've seen the film then you'll know all their skulls are intact. Later on though, the Predator adds the crews to his collection and he didn't bother with these guys because he didn't see them as equals. Instead it's a calling card to signal the hunts on and the Predator actually acts a lot like a hunter. Hunters will tend to survey and stalk their prey silently and they'll follow them until they get the perfect shot. There's also the equipment he uses and hunters sometimes use wooden pipes to mimic a duck call. Now, I kind of feel like this is why the Predator later uses Billy's laugh and it lines up with how hunters act in real life. Now Billy finds bullet casings and he guesses that the Green Berets were firing while he into the jungle. This is something that the characters later do because as we know they can't see the Predator. They're clearly panicked and just firing at random and I feel like this gets flipped come the final act. When Dutch makes himself invisible through using mud he manages to get the upper hand and he lands a devastating blow. This causes the Predator to start firing randomly and it shows just how much the roles have reversed. At this point Blaine breaks out his minigun and this is actually something that we've seen in our breakdowns before. If you watched our Terminator 2 one then you'll know how we talked about the one there being a similar model to what's shown in this movie. However it actually goes beyond that, I, I, I learned something myself and this is the exact same gun that's used in both films. It's also at this point that we get the Predator's vision now we can see things from its point of view. In this movie, we, we only get the thermal and infrared ones, but the sequels show it has more than just these two. However, our Reddit user xraygirl127 pointed out that you do get other hints towards it having other modes. It wouldn't be able to avoid the tripwires without having additional ones and thus there has to be more on top of what we get. Now just in the same way that it observes them before striking, we see as Dutch also does this too. Spying on the camp, they make a plan and we get a big bombastic over the top scene played out like a classic action movie. This shows us exactly how good these guys are. Stick around. And Oni actually improvised this line, which I think shows, you know, that they're just the hamming it up. Now in the lead up to it, they come across a claymore mine which Blaine nearly triggers. However, we watch as they stop and disarm it. Ever resourceful, they actually use this mine later at roughly the one hour minute mark, and the one they plan for the Predator is the exact same mine. You can tell this because Max sticks a twig in the top of it, which he later pulls out when they're setting up the trap. Dutch also pushes a truck in which confuses the enemy and it allows the group to strike whilst they're unaware of what's happening. Now these are the tactics the Predator uses too, with confusion and the element of surprise being a prime weapon. None of the rebels ever had a chance and we later learn this is why the group was called in. Turns out they were actually brought in to stop a Soviet backed invasion and the Green Berets from before were actually on the same mission. The cabinet minister was really CIA and the paranoia arises for what's going on. You get the feeling that we don't know what's happening and this is heightened by whatever's in the jungle. I love how there's almost this superstitious element to it and the predator could easily be seen as a ghost. It's an apparition, a personification of death and we'll talk about the symbolism behind this later in the video. 
Capturing a rebel named Anna, they head for the border as the area is too hot for the helicopters to land. Now speaking of a different kind of heat, we of course have the jungle itself and what we learn about the predator species. It's said that they come during the hottest years and Anna rattles off a story the elders of a village used to tell the children. When I was little we found a man. He looked like... like butchered. El diablo cazador de hombres. In the hottest years this happens. El que hace trofeos de los hombres means the demon who makes trophies of man. Seen as a demon, we know in hindsight that the predators come from a hot planet and that they've started visiting us more and more due to the earth heating up. Now Duke saves Dylan by killing a scorpion on his back and I was wondering if this was reverse symbolism for him backstabbing them. Probably a reach, but the predator later picks us up and studies it and I'd like to think this identifies the scorpion as a predator and this is why the group become even more elevated in status. The Hawkins tells Billy a joke which makes him burst out laughing and this is what the predator ends up recording. <laughs> it actually plays this back very, very faintly and this is what tips Billy off that something might be watching them. <laughs> This is what the creature of course also uses at the end and it plays it back after setting off the self-destruct. Now Sonny Landham who played Billy was infamous for his short temper and he was notorious for getting in fights on set when people wouldn't hit the thumbs up button. The studio actually had to hire a bodyguard for him whose sole purpose was to protect other people from him. Now as they move further in we can clearly sense that something's off. Before this video, I, I of course knew all the stuff with Van Damme and I was thinking like they must have had to reshoot so much of the movie due, just due to the suit change. However, when you rewatch it, you don't actually see the Predator that much and outside of the third act, the costume's barely in it. Instead, we get long shots at nothing other than the jungle and I love how this gets you to also look about the scene to see if you can make it out. Also, just this bit was killing me laughing a bit. How, like, there's a part where Arnie just walks in holding a massive machine gun at a perfect right angle, and this is solely just to make his bicep pop out even more. No way is that any way to hold a gun like that. You would never be trained to do that, but my man's done it because he's that fucking hard. Now, during these moments, we also get a snake creeping in, and these animals can also sense infrared just like the predator. Now Anna makes a break for it, which is when the predator attacks and we get the iconic sort of rattlesnake clicking. <laughs> if you listen closely, you can actually hear this very early on in the movie and it happens just before they discover the skinned bodies. Later on, we actually hear the creature's voice and this was portrayed by Peter Cullen. <laughs> In case you don't know, he also voiced Optimus Prime and I love how you can kind of hear the similarities in the performance. He was the one who developed the clicking sound because he said the predator's face reminded him of a dying crab. Anyway, Blaine's shot too with a predator attacking from the trees and in a nice, nice carryover we see he's wearing an MTV t-shirt. Not a massive detail but when we saw him getting off the chopper he, he was wearing it at the start and I appreciate the continuity in the costume department. Now the blast comes from the Predator's shoulder gun, which was named the Parrot Gun by the creative team. Mac actually gets a look at it and its eyes glow gold just before it runs off. This was done to mimic the eyes of a cat, which of course to some is a Predator too. Mainly if you're a mouse, yeah, but at least to them just firing into the jungle. Blood is found, which lets them know it can be killed and this was made through using the liquid from inside glow sticks. Now that night we cut to Mac reminiscing over the good times he had with Blaine and he's clearly been affected heavily by his death. A wild boar leaps out and attacks them and after Mac kills it we get a really cool detail. Think you could have found something bigger? Yeah, fuck you, <laughs> Fuck you. Where's the girl? Now watch the scene closely again and see if you notice anything. Think you could have found something bigger? Yeah, fuck you, <laughs> Fuck you. Where's the girl? So in it we can hear Billy's laugh, but he's not on screen when this is going on. When we cut back to the group, none of them are laughing either, and I think this is actually the predator mocking Mac. Think you could have found something bigger? Yeah, fuck you, <laughs> Fuck you. Where's the girl? 
Now, it turns out this was a distraction to take Blaine's body, and it tips them off that it's acting like a hunter searching for its trophies. They try and even the odds by setting up their own traps, and as we wait, we see Mac shaving his head. This was improvised by Bill Duke, and they quickly scramble to put some fake blood onto it, and we, you can see this when we get the nice cut away, and then cut back to see it bleeding. Now, I love the shot where we think Dutch might have it in its sights, but it turns out it's actually sneaking up behind him. Again, in panic, it fires off randomly, but this sets off one of the traps, which then injures Poncho. Mac runs to avenge his friend's death, and Dylan rushes after him, which in some ways helps to redeem the character. He of course owes him because he saved him from the scorpion before, but eventually this leads to both the characters' deaths. I feel like the Predator uses its recording tech once more, as we hear Mac say a line which then gets repeated. Over here. Now Mac's head is turned into lasagna and the character is shot directly through the skull. Later on when the predator is cleaning its trophy we can actually see his skull and tell that it's his due to the big hole in the middle of it. Now Rob Ager has done a fantastic breakdown of just this scene that you should definitely check out right after this. I don't want to just copy the whole thing uh, and it's about 8 minutes long but it talks about the techniques that are applied here. It starts off with what's known as a farewell look between Dutch and the character that's often used as a way to set up their death. As he sneaks through the leaves, we watch as the camera somewhat stalks him, and it even brushes the leaves out the way, making us feel like it's been hunting him. He's a character who's been in denial the entire movie, but the close zoom to his face comes in as he has a moment of realisation. Looking back at him is Mac's stone cold eyes, which Rob said represents the face of death. It then mimics Mac's voice from when he saved him from the scorpion, and this makes him spin around just like the scene from before. We watch as Dylan looks through the jungle and you can actually catch the predator just before he does. We get a wide shot where we can see it standing on a branch and it then cuts to Dylan who at first misses it. He then looks back which is when he spots it but I got it before you mate and you deserve to die. Now when Dylan's arm's blown off you can see the wire which allows the beam to travel to it directly. Bit of, bit of well, well, well seeing the wires there and I feel like a dick for pointing it out but I'd get comments if I didn't. Either way, it leads to Billy's death and the Predator picks off Poncho, leaving just Dutch and Anna. We get the infamous line, Get to the chopper! Which Arnie's actually said is his favourite catchphrase. Going over the waterfall, we see as he swims in and the giant tree can be seen which becomes part of the action later on. Dutch gets to the shore but the Predator still stalks him and it's at this point we see the creature in all its glory. The water damages the cloak and it lets Dutch know that there are actually ways that you can force it to appear. Now it's also with this that he discovers the mud masks his heat signature which means that he now has a way that he can go invisible. With this as a weapon he's now got the power to take it on and he spends a day setting up traps to take it in the night. Home alone, eat your heart out and Dutch is now here to show who's the king of the hunt. <laughs> I love how the Predator heats its blades too, and Mac also uses fire as a way to draw its attention. It of course sees in heat vision, so we'll constantly be drawn to this, and what we get is an excellent showdown that happens between the pair. There's clear nods to Apocalypse now, and it devolves into an almost animalistic battle played out amongst the wilderness. Everything about the movie feels so stripped down now, and, and tonally it's completely opposite to the opening act of the film. There's barely any dialogue at all, and all the bombastic and over-the-top bravado has been stripped away to tell a more centralised cerebral story. This movie would massively influence the action films that followed it, and when analysing it for this video, I actually realised this could be seen as a turning point in the genre. The 80s were of course completely over the top when it came to their heroes, but the 90s changed things up and started playing more with the everyman who was a quick thinker. John McClane would of course come to embody this, but the tonal shift can be seen in this movie too. We start off with a big send off of the 80s catchphrase heavy films, but head towards more personal and grounded battles that don't have much dialogue. Now the Predator actually best Dutch and he has him at his mercy, but due to honour and him actually providing a fight, he decides to go hand to hand after revealing his face. It's such an iconic unmasking scene and the focus on the mandibles really elevates the character. 
talked earlier about Stan Winston coming up with the idea for the, the, the main alien, but apparently it was James Cameron who added this bit in, according to the legends. Anyway, we watched the beating through the eyes of the Predator, and it's clear Dutch isn't really a match for him physically. However, he has his carefully laid traps, which will allow Dutch to smash him like it's the like button. Do it! Do it! Come on! Come on! Kill me! I'm here! Kill me! Do it! Come on, smash the like button. I've asked, I've asked twice now, do it! Now, the Predator avoids the first trap, but Dutch's backup plan ends up being the one that works. Dutch had one last trick up his sleeve, but unfortunately for him, the Predator did too. We get the iconic countdown scene with the Predator playing out Billy's laugh, and Dutch runs for his life as he tries to escape the blast. Now, I have seen people saying that there's no way Dutch could have survived a nuke, and in the second film we learn how big the blast was. According to that, it destroyed 25 kilometers worth of terrain, so you're probably thinking, how did he get out of this? Well, there's actually a lot of things that people misinterpret about the ending, and most think that the Predator's a sore loser when it's actually not the case. If he was, then he would have just set the bomb off without a countdown, because why even give the guy time to escape if you just want him to die along with you? As we see the explosion starting up, we can see that electricity lights up the forest. This shows that it's not necessarily a full on nuke, and that it has electrical properties too. Won't get into EMPs or anything like that, because it's a whole different subject, but yeah, it's not really a typical blast, and there are more, more of a focus on electricity. Now, the PS2 game Predator Urban Jungle explained this explosion was more designed to wipe out the Predator's ship and all evidence of its existence. There's also a brilliant post on Reddit by user Ghost of Your Mom that actually explains a lot of the scene, and I think when we go over it, you might start to see the movie's ending in a different light. Now, Predators have an honor culture similar to the Vikings, where they seek, seek to die in glorious battle to get into Valhalla. The Predator is rightfully beaten in combat, and then Dutch comes in over the top to deliver the killing blow. However, as you see, Dutch begins to hesitate. He's potentially going to show the alien mercy and spare him, which will rob him of his earned honourable death. So the next best thing to do is go out in a self-imposed blaze of glory, rather than just simply dying and bleeding out on the floor. He knows that he could kill Dutch with the touch of a button, but that would make him a sore loser, so he sets off the self-destruct. The Predators can set the yield of their self-destruct system, and he clearly didn't turn it up to 11, but rather gave Dutch enough that he could realistically get enough distance between himself and the eventual explosion. Now, as for the Billy laugh, this comes across like the Predators mocking Dutch and thinking that he's going to die. However, the Predator isn't really doing a last laugh, and it's just playing back the only way that it actually knows how to convey something in his language. It's not an actual laugh per se, and rather it's playing back Billy's laugh because it's one of the recordings that it picked up. So yeah, huge shout out to them. Their comment's way bigger, but that's me just cherry picking the main points of it. Let me know if you agree with that or not, but it does kind of reframe the ending and how it plays out. Either way, we end with Dutch being rescued and taking out in a similar manner to how he arrived. It's a complete tonal shift to them coming in at the start though, and it perfectly reflects the hell that he's just gone through. Now we end with the credits, which include the cast smiling and giving a little nod to the audience. This is supposed to be a homage to older war films like The Dirty Dozen, The Great Escape, and it became a staple of the genre that just helped to define it. Those would have full credit scenes in them with names, and it's something that the older movies adopted as an evolution of the curtain call. The actors would come out at the end and give a bow, and in war movies they were used to give the idea that everyone was part of a brotherhood. Kind of funny how everyone filmed their own bit for this section, except Donnie, who they just reused footage for. He's the only one who doesn't smile, but I can't find anywhere why this was the case and have no idea why it happened. If you know, then let me know below, and that wraps up Predator. Clocking in at a body count of 69 humans, one scorpion, one boar, and one Predator, we now have one of the best action movies of all time. Going back to it made it really open my eyes to how much it changed things, and it's up there as being one of the big reasons that Arnie would become the highest paid actor of all time at one point in the 90s. Though people often criticise his acting abilities, he definitely put his heart and soul into this, and even sacrificed a lot of his own personal life to get this movie made. Arnie actually married Maria Shriver during production, with him leaving on a Friday and returning back to work on the Wednesday to get the ball rolling. Guy apparently was going to have a honeymoon, but his wife could tell he was distracted and she said, just go make the movie and we got what we got. All in all, the work ethic comes through and what we get is a film that hits on every level. 
It's got a great memorable supporting cast, an unforgettable villain, and a film that evolves and changes over time. It leaves us with what's an incredible movie, and I hope that you've enjoyed the breakdown on it too. If you did, we, we, again, we'd appreciate the thumbs up, and make sure you subscribe for videos like this almost every day. If you want to be extra generous, and you can click the join button and support the channel for the price of less than a can of Coke at your local chippy. As a thank you, you'll get to see videos like this before everyone else does, and it makes a massive difference in keeping us independent and, yeah, just helping out with everything. We really, really appreciate it, and if you want something else to watch, then definitely check out our breakdown of Terminator and Terminator 2, which will be linked on screen right now. We've had some copyright issues with it, and Studio Canal won't let us use footage of Terminator 2 in Europe. However, we've disputed it, but it's, it's a bit all over the place and kind of going back and forth. If you want to watch it though, you'll have to visit through using a VPN connection connected to America. Uh, so sorry for all the hoops on that, but yeah, we are trying to sort it out. Anyway, thank you for your patience and hopefully I'll see you over another video soon. Without the way, I've been Paul, you've been the best and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.